Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Welcome inside the lodge today. This time of the year, it gets a little tricky to stay up on video. So this week, we're actually here before the next client trip starts. And uh, it's raining out, so we're taking full advantage of this. Going to try, always try, guys, is to get you some um, plans or advice or strategies, maybe something to think about going in um, ahead of the weekend. Reason for that is this is the pretty popular time of the, the year, uh, depending on where you're at in the country, right, to get out and get these projects started. That leads in to this topic, guys. Uh, this kind of stems from our video of the month that we did for, um, for January, which is still available if anybody's interested in that. Um, we're going to continue to do that. Uh, and it kind of stems from and leads into um, February's video of the month, uh, which is going to be on maintenance of, of bedding areas. So today, guys, first and foremost, we're going to talk about how to start the process, right? So first and foremost, guys, we need to talk about where to start, right? And that's always, per, like I mentioned in my Habitat book with my clients, always ladies first, right? We need to be gentlemen about this. We need to start with the ladies. All joking aside, guys, is that that is very, a very, very powerful piece of this puzzle. The reason that I do that with a lot of cl uh, clients around the country is just because of that. We're all busy. We've got kids and sports and, you know, running around the country um, like I do, helping, a, you know, um, a lot of folks on the road, burning diesel fuel, right? And when we have the opportunity to, to do that, uh, we might get halfway through it and have to quit and go do something else, right? So if you start that process internal in buck bedding areas, you might not get your doe bedding areas done. So I always tell my clients this, and I've said this before here on the channel, because I really believe in it. If you never cut in a, a buck bedding pocket or an internal pocket um, other than your doe bedding, you're not doing your, your property any harm because they will find a place to bed. So do you need that? And would I highly recommend doing that eventually? Uh, of course. But really focus on the doughs first. If we suck the dough drama out to the outside nearest your food sources, place them where we need to per a stand location or stand assemblage, they'll find a place if it's open, right? Uh, so the, the bucks will find a place to, to bed, right, internal. If that nearest habitat to that food source, like we were talking, guys, is internal, two, three, two, three, four hundred yards, it's going to be saturated with does. Totally defeats the whole purpose. It is it great to bed deer on your property? Of course it is. But if it doesn't tie to the flow of the property, per the way I design anyway, you're not getting there um, in a timely fashion like you should. You should. So first and foremost, ladies first, right? So that this is kind of a a, a three-step process of where my mind goes when I walk into these areas. So I'm always looking for the big canopy, right? Through a canopy release, what I'm looking for is keep trees, oaks. Here is a number that I touch on a lot with clients, guys, that I really think that folks don't believe. And this comes from the days being in the timber with the U.S. Forest Service. We used, we used to select cut a couple hundred acres a year. Um, we were building roads, state highway and county roads in the summer. And then, obviously, we were in doing that. My uncle's background in logging, my dad's background, my grandfather's. And what I was taught, and a lot of your foresters through the government programs will teach you this, is a highly productive 18, 20, 24 inch oak tree that has board per foot value and is producing, let's just use a white oak, right? Is producing white oak acorns. That tree, if you release the canopy around it, and put more sunlight to that tree, it's going to produce in the first year, will produce 50% more tonnage through hard mass um, than it did before. The habitat twist on it is this. Red oak that produce acorns every other year, uh, white oak that produces every year. Um, the sad reality of that, guys, is you can go into these areas, you can take a five gallon pail around 80 acres, 120 acres, in the most productive time of that tree's life and, and during that, that hard mass cycle, and you will not fill that five-gallon pail with acorns. I guarantee you, you won't. 
in most areas. And here's the reason why, is because everything eats acorns. Squirrels, raccoons, turkeys, which is great, right? We're feeding the wildlife, that's great. But what happens is the deer are in that spectrum somewhere, and a lot of times are at the end of that spectrum. So where the habitat value comes in is this. You have to be able to put that same or way more tonnage at their head, head level and, and a way to feed them because deer, maybe rabbits, rabbits don't eat much, but deer are the only thing in the whitetail range that is going to eat woody browse. That's why instead of you know taking everything away from a, a 12 or 14 inch high valued oak tree and leaving it standing and wanting it to produce you a bunch of acorns, what you're doing is you're, you're way better off to put that tree on the ground at deer head height, hinged to keep alive, right? To create structure and to feed deer for years to come. So that's why that's that whole education piece piece of that, right? Now, like I said, that's where the logger and the forester versus the habitat part of it, the FSI versus TSI comes in. But that 12 to 14 inch oak tree, guys, hinged, at deer head heights will outperform usually twice as much tonnage as that that 14, 16, 18, 24 inch great oak tree will ever produce. So keep that in mind. But here's the thing. We don't need, uh, in, let's just use the, these as an acre, okay? Acre food plot, acre dough bedding. We don't need 25 producing acorns or, or white oaks producing acorns. And we surely don't need 75% of them 12 to 15 inch trees all hinge cut in a bedding area, all hinged. We need a mix of both. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So that's where my mind goes when I'm in these areas, guys. That's how you get used to seeing what you keep, what you cut, what it needs to look like at the end. Number two, I immediately go into removing the invasives. It, so it, it, you know, it could take a little bit longer per tree, right? But you go in and you kind of make rabbit habitat out of those. Uh, throw them on top, throw the log on top of, of the top. If you're, if you are killing the area, you're spraying that stump, then pile the stuff on. If it's something that you want to regenerate, make sure you're not piling and making rabbit ha habitat on top of that regeneration stump. Um, then what we go through is we talk about number three, possibly, possibly, right? The big possibly, uh, Go in and, and look at your 10 to 12 inch trees and hinge 10 to 20% of those. So that's what gets us into today topic. Sometimes, guys, there's no there's nothing because of the species. Maybe it is all poplar, maybe popple, uh, cherry, stuff like that. You're not going to hinge cut those. You're just going to kill cut them, right? So learning curve there, but that's where my mind goes. I'm looking for what I'm looking for to hinge is... Uh, maple, hard, you know, hard maple, soft maple, and your oaks. There you go again. Mo makes most people cringe and shake their head. But what are red oaks? Uh, guys, err on a side of caution with red oaks. If it's the right size tree in the right time, you can get it to hinge. Go slow with them. But red oaks are best just cutting. They're a barber chair accident waiting to happen. So like your white oak, hard hickory, hard maple, soft maple, like I said, those, those are the ones that, you know, are going to get you the best hinge, right? White oak especially is really stringy, so it stays, makes a beautiful hinge. Um, so this is the topic that we're on, guys, right? Um, what we're going to talk about is this. This is what I, so food plot here, the blue, uh, my black marker kind of gave up on me here, but blue being the transition, right, the line of travel. And like I said, is this flipped? Is it not because of your access, thermals, all that plays in. But typically, we want to slide that buck past a food plot securely, right? Um, so what we're doing is this. We're looking at this area as perfect example, example one and example two, right? So this here would be looking at this area that has multiple diff different size, these black uh, dots would be the multiple different sizes of canopy or, or trees that we're looking at that causes different canopy. Top story, second story, possibly third story, right? So like we said, guys, let's start here. 
we're going to look at this one on what not to do. We're going to look at our, our checklist here, right? And we're going to look at this and say, okay, I'm going to go in there and I'm going to remove the canopy. And so we're going to, we're going to kill cut all these trees down, these bigger trees. We're going to get rid of those, get them out of the sky, right? Release that big canopy. We're going to put all this down. Like I said, sorry for the illustration. We're going to put all these down and we're going to get all these big ones out of here first which is what you want to do. Then what we're going to do is we're going to go in and we're going to hinge cut. The rest we're going to get rid of our invasives and we're going to lay those down. And then we're going to go in and we're going to look and we're going to hinge cut everything else. Problem with that is guys, you can see where this is going. It's a mess, an absolute mess. That's sadly what I see a lot of folks doing is just thinking that everything needs to go. That is kind of the, the tornado effect, the definition of tornado effect is that we don't want to do, right? So this, this one here, guys, is what we don't want to get ourselves into. And to be honest with you guys, it's way too much work, right? It's way too much uh, tree work. You're in there, you're, you're trapped up on your feet. It's an accident waiting to happen, and it doesn't have to be that way. And like I said, only a very few properties that I've ever been on, I said, take that acre and, and, and hinge cut the entire thing. Very few, right? Um, this one here, guys, is what we want it to, what we want to do with it is what we, how we want it to turn out. So this is going to be our, our yes versus our no. We go back to the same checklist, right? Remove the large canopy first. I'm looking at keep trees. So I immediately go and say, okay, these are my keep trees. These are my oaks in there. Maybe I've got three of them. Maybe I've got four of them that are nice producers that look like they're going to produce acorns for me for 10, 15, 20 years, right? They're not, they're not the biggest ones. They're not the smallest ones. Too big of ones and too many of them are shade killers, right? So and those big oaks and stuff cast a big, big crown. That crown cast a big shade, right? So you don't want a bunch of them. I want to pick one that's that 12, 14 inch, 16 inch tree that's really good and straight, looks healthy. If I take some canopy around, around or down around it, I can put some light onto that thing and get it to produce dropping some acorns from above. Then my brain immediately goes to, we got our keep trees. And then I might kill cut this one and get this one on the ground. I might get this one on the ground. I might get this one on the ground. And then I'm looking at, okay, and maybe, maybe this one on the ground, right? So then I'm looking at, okay, now I've got a lot of the big canopy taken away. Now I'm looking at my invasives. And then I'm going to do with my invasives is I'm going to take the invasives, you know, kill cut the invasives, and I'm going to put those in a slash pile or a rabbit habitat pile, right? I'm going to take this one. I'm going to put that one. I'm going to cut this one down and we're going to make a rabbit habitat. We're going to pile this on top of each other here. We're going to pile this on, on top of each other here, this one. So now those are gone. That area is gone, but you, it's, it looks porous, right? It's open. Then the next thing you do is possibly look at that as far as hinge cutting. So you might have an opening to put a hinge here. You might have an opening to put a hinge here. You might have this one here to put a hinge. In the meantime, guys, is all of this is you could you could take the um, you could take a walk through here, and some of this is going to be canopied on top of each other. You know, this situation is going to happen where the, this tree is going to go down, and and the canopy is going to be on top of this one, and that's okay. Uh, like we said, guys, the biggest thing is is try not to V them. Um, where the, the, this, if there was a tree here, this goes in and, or this goes in here and trap, traps them in here. And now you have this V in here where they can't get out of. If that happens, poke a hole in it, like we said, right? Um, but what you, the object is, guys, is this, is go through, you're able to go through there and you're able to navigate around this area, right? Things can walk in, walk out. They're not trapped. There's a bunch of trails inside of this area that lead in and out. So that's how I recommend building that so it's porous. Tornado, too much. Perfect situation, don't get yourself in trouble. Err on the side of caution to, to start with. 
and do it light first and if you need more you can always add more but if you do too much there's no bringing this situation back unless you're going to do something like i am going to finish this video with what i would highly recommend guys is this and not a lot of people will recommend that you do this but i recommend this this situation might not need it first this situation needs it immediately what i'm speaking of guys is i like to make these cubicles stand out so it may be a maze in here and they can get away from predation. That's great. So this one might, you might not need this to do this for 10 years. This one here, guys, what I'm doing, and if you get yourself in this trouble or you buy a property that's got that or whatever the case is, um, go in here and for every 20 yards, like we talked on this food plot, take that mulcher, that six foot uh, mulcher on a skid steer, and you're putting a real, you're mulching out a real snake trail. Uh, corridor every 20 yards from the food plot all the way up to the back from the front to the back and you're mulching that six foot trail out of there now what you've got guys is this is going to look like this you're going to have this open trail all the way to the back and what you've made by doing that guys is you've made what i refer to as these cubicles so if you have a a, uh, a um, mulcher at your dispense then maybe you go in, you cut a little bit harder, knowing you're just going to go in and mulch those trails back out and make these separation cubicles. Because if a doe is bedded here, all she's got to do is take a jump out here. She hits this and she's gone, right? She takes a jump here, hits this, and she's gone. So the, the goal behind that, guys, is this. is This this is something you can save. You can do this. It's going to take a mulcher to clean it up. So if you go too far, get the mulcher in there. And, and I'm not saying mulch everything away, just these six foot corridors go up to the back and back through or from the back front to the back and back out and uh, six foot wide trails, make them real snake traily and things can get in and out of there. This situation here, guys, like I said, you might not have to do this for years. Eventually, when this regenerates, it's going to get to a point where it's woolly in here that I recommend doing that. So you're going to have like we had here, right? You're going to have this look in here. Eventually, this is the look that you're going to have, right? You're going to have these corridors that go in and divide your dough bedding. And I'm going to tell you something, guys, here, why this is so important. Why this is such a, a important piece of the puzzle to break this into cubicles. You don't have to mulch these trails in. You can navigate through something like that if you don't go overboard. If you go overboard, I'd recommend, or in the future, I'd recommend mulching those out. And you don't have to mulch them. You can cut these trails out with a chainsaw. Here's why, guys, is if you have an acre of a food plot, you can have two, two does and their two fawns. And if they're boss does and they're antisocial, uh, what happens is um, they will run they will run everybody out of there. They, do, they don't like anybody else in there. They don't like noise. Uh, they just want to be by themselves. So what I where I'm going with that guys is this is if you if you have one or two in here and they run the whole they run the whole thing, you aren't getting the value of your dough budding area, right? But if you if you make the cubicles out of it through chainsaw or and or mulching, what you're going to find guys is you can put two three here, like I said. In this one, you can put one or two, three in this cubicle, two, three, four, five in here. You can put all these does bedded in here. Now you have 15, 12 plus does, and you might have, with without the corridors and in this mess, you might have two, right? So that's the power of breaking this cubicles into pieces because they feel like they're in their own little world. They're in their own cubicles. They can do their own thing. And I think, I feel, and I find on my projects, especially here, um, and a lot of properties around the country, I guess I should say, you build it that way, guys, you, you have a, uh, a chance to house more in those areas. If you're housing more does in your doe bedding areas, you're going to promote more cruising buck mentality past the, those locations further into the rut. 
If you house them in the rut, you house them in the second rut, you house them there in the summer, they know where they're at when they come back. I mean, it, it never ends. It's their home, right? It's their world. Uh, so so that's, the, that's the key pieces, guys, where my brain works going towards those first. Let them tell you what they want. If you build a property, if you build a doe bedding area, right, this year, and you go in there and they're an acre, it just didn't, uh, something's still missing, right? Find out what it's missing. If there isn't a lot of beds in there, they need more browse. They need more, they need more structure. Give them a little bit more, right? All of a sudden, it's too thick and the stuff that you did before, now there's nothing in there. Well, you know, you went too far. Go in there and clean it up. Sooner or later, you're going to find that you're going to hit it just right. And it's, it's amazing. An acre food plot, or an acre food plot backed up by an acre doe bedding, guys, it'll shock you how many deer that you can actually put in there. 